Investor's Business Daily oftentimes has some really interesting stuff, often on the front page of their paper. And they have been very critical of Obamacare, of the economy, of the, the consequences of that. And today they have an article out. It says low wage work week, or, or, sorry, excuse me, low wage work weeks slashed to avoid Obamacare mandate. And I'm going to read a little bit from the article. It says, in April, non-supervisory workers in low-wage private industries clocked the shortest work week on record, just 27.3 hours. These industries, which pay averages of up to about $14.50 an hour, have landed 1.6 million jobs since the start of 2013, with an average work week of just 21 hours. Now, that's going to be important here in a minute. 1.6 1.6 million people hired with an average work week of 21 hours a week. In 2015, companies with at least 100 full-time equivalent workers who don't offer coverage could face fines of $2,000 for each full-time worker. That tax penalty rises to $2,160 per full-time worker in 2016, which will be the first year that employer mandate applies to companies with 50 to 100 full-time equivalent workers. The number of workers usually clocking 25 to 29 hours a week just uh, has grown by 407,000 people, or 12%, since December of 2012. Meanwhile, the number of workers usually working 31 to 34 hours per week has shrunk to uh, 168,000 by 7%. So let me that's a lot of numbers in there. But let me break down what happens, what has happened here. The Obamacare mandate, they've been pushing back the employer mandate for years. But now that employer mandate is starting to affect companies. And these companies are looking at this and they're saying, okay, I've got, I'm looking at, if I have over 30 employees, I'm going to be at risk. Obviously, if I have 50 or more employees, I'm going to be at risk of having to pay a fine if I don't offer health care to all of my full-time employees. And you've got a lot of companies out there like McDonald's and Home Depot and Lowe's and that have massive numbers of full-time employees. We've also got an Obama recovery. And I say Obama recovery because he's the one who takes credit for it anytime anything goes well. Anytime anything goes bad and it's something that was out of his control. But since he's claiming that this is really good stuff, we're going to talk about it. He's talking about unemployment now at 5.6% or whatever it is. And you say, well, but you look around and you say, yeah, but household incomes are declining. How can that be? How can I be losing household income and yet I have an unemployment rate that's 5.5%? That doesn't make sense to me. Well, it shouldn't make sense because there's an error there somewhere. Part of it is the way that they calculate a worker. So you see how I said that the... uh, Number of jobs, there's been 1.6 million jobs created with an average work week of 21 hours a week. That means most people are working, more people are working part-time. Since December of 2012, we've seen an increase of 400,000 workers make, uh, who work between 25 and 29 hours a week. But over that, we've seen a reduction in workers. So what's happening is, you see, if you work over 30 hours a week under Obamacare, you're considered a full-time worker. So companies are looking around, and the, and the fines are assessed on the companies based on how many full-time employees you have. So that guy who's working 30, 32 hours a week, he's still technically part-time. He's kind of between half-time and full-time. He now is in this really dangerous area because the government says you've got to count that guy as a full-time worker, and you're going to be assessed a tax based on, uh, based on how many employees you have who work more than 30 hours a week. And so you're seeing employers who have to have people, they're cutting their workforce down below 30 hours a week, down to around 27 or so just to be safe. And they're not allowing any of their employees to work more than 27 hours a week if they're part-time. And so that is creating a shift. That's why you see 400,000 new jobs at at part-time, and you're seeing everybody who's working more than 30 hours a week, that's declined by 168,000. I hope that these numbers aren't messing you up because this is really important for you to understand. So you're seeing a shift of part-time workers who are now forced to work less in order to get under the Obamacare mandate. But here's the problem, and this is a very big problem because most people don't understand this. Under the Obamacare mandate, it's not just how many part-time workers you have. 
It's also the cumulative hours that those part-time workers work. So let me give you an example. Let's say that you have three part-time workers, each who work 10 hours a week. And a company says, oh, I think I'm good there. I've got those three part-time workers. They don't count. I'm not going to have to be assessed a penalty by, those, by the government because all those guys are under 30 hours a week. The way I read the law, and I've yet to find somebody in academia or in the law that can, can tell me otherwise, those three workers, you combine their hours together. And the government says, well, you got three workers who work 10 hours a week. That's one 30-hour-a-week employee. So you're either going to have to pay a penalty for those three workers or you're going to have to get rid of some workers. So it is incentivizing companies not only to keep their part-time workers under 27 hours, but also to limit the number of jobs to the bare minimum to run skeleton crews as much as humanly possible in order to limit their exposure to the Obamacare mandate. And now you are seeing the results, which is a reduction in full-time workers, a reduction in breadwinner jobs, and those people who are working part-time, those people are working fewer hours part-time, and there are fewer of those part-time jobs available simply because of the way the Obamacare law reads. Now, some of you are sitting on your hands and just screaming at the radio or at the television right now and saying, how could this be, Jason? Why weren't we told of this? May I direct you to the paper that I wrote after the Obamacare law was passed, where I talked about these things and after I could read the bill. Because you remember Nancy Pelosi said, we have to pass the bill so that you can find out what's in the bill. So I wasn't available to alert you to this in advance. But I did tell you what was going to happen after the bill was passed. And here's the crazy thing about it. Everybody's talking about premiums going up and, and, and how it's going to affect you and how everything's going to cost more and there's going to be a two, uh, two different groups of people who are going to receive health care, those who can pay for private care and those who are forced to go on Obamacare. That is not the scariest piece. And that's what I, when I wrote The Coming Divide, which is what this paper is, I'm going to cite to you here in a minute, I wrote it because I wanted to share with you what the real disaster of Obamacare was going to be. I said the real disaster is going to be an employment disaster. It has nothing to do with health care. It has everything to do with employment. And so I want to read for you what I said. Let me get it here. All right. What you will see, this is from the coming divide. I wrote this in the end of 2011 or 2012, I think I wrote this. What you will see, what you are seeing, is companies will start mandating a maximum number of hours any part-time employee can work in a given week. And we're actually seeing that happen right now. I said, but there's one more thing we need to talk about. Under the new law, penalties are assessed not just on the number of employees who work more than 30 hours a week, but also on the combination of employees who hour, whose hours equal 30 hours in a given week. The new law will have a very damaging effect on entry-level workers. And then I talk about when I turned 16 and how I went to work for a pizza shop and, and, and the opportunity that, that created for me and the sense of hard work that I, I, was, able, I was able to gain a sense of, of what hard work did and, and the value of hard work. If you are new to the workforce or if you have no valuable skills to offer, you are likely dependent on an employer who will let you start at the bottom. But what happens when you go to fill out the application and you find out that there's nothing available, that the company has cut its workforce to the bare minimum, and they have a mountain of applications of overqualified people for work? You spend weeks or even months looking for a job, and all you're able to find is a job working 10 hours a week for a company that needs someone to fill in for a couple of months. Full-time opportunities have become almost non-existent. The ones that do exist are highly coveted. If you can manage to find work, that gives you full 40 hours, count your blessings. Of course, since those jobs are in such high demand, the pay for these jobs is going to go down as employers have mountains of applications of overqualified people and a massive part-time workforce with which to evaluate potential candidates. For new workers and the unskilled, Obamacare will create the ultimate glass ceiling. In the land of upward mobility, most will find themselves working two, three, or even four part-time jobs to earn enough money to pay their bills. On the other side of the fence will be the well-connected, well-educated, and protected class 
that have good jobs and highly coveted full-time positions. We will become the land of the haves and the have-nots, the land of kings and peasants. Wealth inequality will explode as a once vibrant middle class is reduced to serfdom. It will not be a pretty picture. So how do you get out of it? How do you protect, protect yourself? How do you ensure that you don't face dark days ahead? And then I go on to explain, you eliminate one word from your vocabulary, dependency. And guys, this is I've been talking about this stuff for years. This is not new. The show is not new. The concepts are not new. But what did I say? I said, wealth inequality will explode. What have we been seeing? What is everybody complaining right now about? What is Bernie Sanders talking about? Wealth inequality. The rich keep getting richer. The poor are getting richer slower. What we need is more government, right? We need more laws. We need more protections. We need to give people free health care. You know what we need to do? This is what we need to do. We need to offer a higher minimum wage. Because that's not going to further limit worker opportunity. That's not going to hurt the poorest among us. No, let's just burden. In, in addition to burdening employers with the requirement to provide health care or pay a penalty, let's also burden them with higher expenses for their labor. Let's force them to pay someone more than they're worth in an attempt to try and raise people out of poverty. What we find out now is that this combination of, this is something that I had not anticipated. I had not anticipated the drive for a nearly double minimum wage. We already know that the minimum wage hurts people. But this idea of doubling the minimum wage and, and, and putting a $15 an hour minimum on the cost of unskilled labor is going to crush opportunity for those who most need that opportunity. Because, you see, if you have very little education, if you were born in the inner city and you ended up at 16 dropping out of school and you got into some trouble and now you're out and you still don't have any money and you're just like, man, I want to get out of this mess. I need a job. I need something, anything. Just let me work. Let me come and learn a skill. I want to work. I'm willing to work. Now that guy goes out. And he starts fishing around. The problem is he doesn't know how to do anything. So he shows up at the construction site. And they say, you know what? We could have you haul wood for us. I did that one summer, by the way. I worked on a construction crew. And I didn't know how to do construction. And so I hauled lumber. They would drop the lumber off and the big, cr- on, you know, all bound up together. And I would take the lumber, the two-by-fours, and bring them from the parking lot, essentially, up to the house. And then the construction guys would put it together and frame the house up. After a little while, they let me use a skill saw, and they taught me how to mark out all of the stuff to make stairs and to make the you know the one by sixes to cut stair uh, legs in them, and how to cut to length the boards that would create the stairs. After I showed that I didn't screw that up very often, then they would bring me up. They'd hand me a nail gun, and they'd say, "Here, take the nail gun. Start nailing together these boards to put this wall together." And after a very short time, a couple of months of doing that, I kind of understood how to build a house. I wasn't uh, ready to to build my own house from scratch, but I went from a guy who was hauling lumber to a guy who knew how to frame a house together. It It was incredible how quickly that happened. I was paid a little better than minimum wage, but not much better. And I was a high school kid. Now imagine that same guy been in trouble, doesn't have any education, trying to figure out how to make things work. He ends up going out to the same construction site, but this time the construction worker says, uh, the the foreman says, you know what, you don't know how to do anything. I I need a guy who not only knows, who's not only got a strong back, but also knows a little bit about carpentry, so he can do some of the little things for us as well, and you don't know how to do that. And you know what, I got a list of guys who know how to do that stuff. Who, who need work. They need full-time work, and they can't get it. And so I'm sorry, son, I just I got nothing for you. Maybe if I could pay you $2 an hour, or maybe if you'd come out and work for free, I could do, you could do the labor and I could teach you the skill. That would be worth it for me. But as it stands right now, sorry. And so that guy finds himself in the awkward position of having no opportunity, no skills. That's what raising the minimum wage does. 
It helps only those people who manage to keep their jobs. It doesn't help anybody who's trying to get a job. It doesn't help anybody who's trying to get a skill. And then you tack on this glorious idea that we were going to give everybody free health care. If you couldn't afford it, don't worry. Health care will be provided for you, just like when you need a lawyer. We'll just get those greedy rich people in the middle class to pay more. They're not paying their fair share anyway. We'll tax corporations for not providing it to you. And then what do we find? You see, it always starts with the best of stated intentions. Notice I didn't say starts with the best of intentions because it's questionable what the intentions of Obamacare, what the intentions of those who want to raise the minimum wage are. But it always starts with the best of stated intentions. They always promise you the things that you're going to get and how wonderful life is going to be. But as always happens, they end up hurting the very people that they're trying to help. You know, guys like Bernie Sanders, I think that he really genuinely believes that if you steal from the rich, provide to the poor, that somehow the poor, they, that he can create this utopia where the poor have great jobs, great paying jobs, and that companies continue to hire them, and he can force health care on everybody, and that he knows how to run it better than everybody else, and, and that if he just had his way, that things would be better. I honestly think he believes that. He's a fool for believing that. Nowhere in history can he point to that being a success. He can point to other countries who do it. They also run massive strangling deficits in order to provide it. But this is one more case, and I told you this would happen. Do you want to know what's going to happen next? Anybody want to know where this is going? A $15 an hour minimum wage coupled with the Obamacare regulation that is coming on corporations is going to cause a chain of events that will lead to a dramatic reduction in part-time workers. People will run bare bones minimum, uh, minimum staff. It's also going to lead to lower growth. And the reason for that is this. Imagine if you run, uh, I use a restaurant because a restaurant is easy for everybody to understand. Let's say that you are doing your job and and you're making a little bit of money and you're considering opening up a second location, a a second, I don't know, Italian joint, because this one's doing pretty good. You're hiring a lot of employees. They're making making money to work their way through school or, or whatever else they're doing. They have a job. And you're turning a good profit. And then you realize, you know what, I think I'm going I'm to open up the second store. And, and I think that if I do that, I can increase my profits by 20%. Found a good manager. I got a guy I've been training up. He came up as, a, as a, one of the wait staff, and then he became a manager, uh, a nighttime manager, and now he's the manager. And I don't really even have to come in anymore because he's really running the show for me. And I think that if I open up the second store, I could move him over there to the new store, and I could make him a partial partner on doing the new store. And we could have two stores together, and I think by the time I worked it all out, I could make a little, I could make some extra money. And then all of a sudden, in comes the government, and the government says, "Oh, by the way, now you're required to pay your employees, your pay for your employees' health care." Oh, and by the way, that waitress that you were paying uh, minimum wage or a little bit less for, and then she gets tips on top of that, that's all done. Now you're going to pay every single one of your wait staff, no matter how much they work, fifteen dollars an hour. And he starts to look at that and he says, well, now not only do I not know whether I can even keep my store open, now I don't know if my restaurant can even run because of the increase in the cost of my labor. But I certainly don't want to open up another store. And you see, that store was going to hire another 25 people, maybe another 30 people. And now that's off the table. Those 30 people will never be hired at that restaurant because that restaurant will now never exist. Some of the restaurants that are faced with these new challenges, they'll stay open. They'll eke by for a few years. Maybe they'll even find a way to make it work, but a lot of them will close. And the 20 or 30 or 50 people who work for that restaurant, those people will be out of work too. And as those people start to go out and look for other work, 
They're going to find that they encounter people who are far more experienced than them, who've been doing it a lot longer. There are mountains of applications. And the minimum wage is so high and the cost to the employer are so great that nobody's going to hire. So you have not only seen injury, stuff that you can watch as companies close, but you also there's also unseen injury, things that we can't possibly perceive because they never end up happening. The companies that don't get created. All of these things are going to occur all because the government wanted to help. It's not going to hurt me. It's not going to hurt other people who make far more than a minimum wage. It's not going to hurt those people who are highly educated or entrepreneurs who know how to make money on their own. It's going to hurt the poorest, the most needy among us. I don't advocate against a minimum wage. I don't advocate against Obamacare and subsidized medical because I hate poor people, because I think they just ought to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and get to work, that they just don't work hard enough or long enough. I don't believe any of those things. I don't believe in a minimum wage. I don't believe in Obamacare because I know how much damage it does to the very people that it claims to help. And this is more evidence. It's more evidence that I am right. It's more evidence that these things are predictable. That economics is not hard to understand. And we can also see what's going to happen in the future. I was right in 2012. I'll be right about what's going to happen in 2016 and beyond. The more the government interferes, the more the government tries to help, the worse it will be. We're talking about the Trans-Pacific Partnership when I get back from the break. Representative Paul Ryan, Republican, Wyoming. Is it Wyoming? No, maybe doesn't matter. Republican has made a classic blunder when talking about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. You see, he's trying to push through the trade authority provision, giving the president the ability to fast-track his trade agreement proposals. The problem is we don't know what any of them are. And if you listen to Paul Ryan, he says, you're not going to find out what they are until we agree with them and pass them. The same man who was yelling at Nancy Pelosi when she made the comment, we have to pass the bill to find out what's in the bill, now says the same thing about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, about the trading authority proposal. We're going to talk about that when we get back. But if you think that this is going to help, that this is going to help bring high-paying jobs to America, you're fooling yourself. It's going to continue to hurt. The government is not there to help you. The government is advancing its own advancing its own agenda, and its agenda has nothing to do with your agenda. And I don't know how much more evidence I can provide to you as proof that the ideas and principles that we promote here are true that the damage government does is severe, and that we must fight against it at every turn. So I'm going to take a break. I'll be right back. 